Fundy Cable 10. You are watching According with Carmen. According with Carmen, community producer and the host are very pleased to explain to our viewers the reason for According with Carmen. The words accord means literally heart to heart. And through the process of having heart to heart conversation with our very special guests, we intend to actively promote excellence in crime prevention, which includes the deterrence of crimes of violence and abuse of the individual, excellent in law enforcement and community services generally. We are extremely interested in the subject matter. Today we have a very special guest who exhibits excellence in community services and also exhibits the utmost in professionalism. Dealing with the very difficult issues concerning education and labor, which ultimately leads to the number one concern, jobs, jobs, jobs. Our guest is very well liked person who happens to be a favorite provincial politician who always deals with the public in a professional manner with a sense of humor. Please welcome our guest, Honorable Vaughn Blaney. Welcome, Mr. Blaney. Delighted to be here, Carmen. I'd like for you to explain to the viewers a little bit about your background. Please. Well, first, and probably most importantly, I'm from the, the greatest little village in Canada, the village of Gagetown, down on the River Road. Uh, I'm a former school teacher. My wife's a teacher. All four of my kids are school teachers. So I, I guess... Uh, I guess that's probably the important thing. I went from uh, teaching school uh, in Gagetown uh, to becoming a member of the Legislative Assembly in 19, uh, 1987. So it's very fitting that you get this portfolio. It's a very relevant portfolio to your background, isn't it? Yes, I, I think so. But I think maybe the, the first four years that I spent in government probably had the greatest influence on the, the work that I'm doing now. And as you well know, I spent four years as the as a Minister of Environment. And that was a that was a very uh, on the front burner type of uh, department at that time, and I think that probably positioned me to uh, to attempt to do the things I'm doing now in, in my new department. Right. How important is community colleges to the province of New Brunswick? Well, community colleges uh, are uh, are a very very important element in the the network of of our post secondary education. Uh, they're uh, they're equally important to uh, uh, to our universities. Uh, to any of the other institutions of, of, of education that we have. And they're all part of that kindergarten from, you know, cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. So they play a very, very important role. And the role has changed. And the role is changing as we, as we speak. The demands uh, and the developments in technology and telecommunications and what have you, it's of the great importance that our community colleges keep pace with the changes in our society and in our markets, as well as our universities. So I would like to think that not only has the role changed and their importance has been heightened, but I think you'll find a, a great degree and maybe even a greater degree of cooperation among all our various uh, post-secondary forms of, of instruction as we all try to, uh, to provide the very best training, skill development, learning uh, for our young people to, in order for them to, uh, to fit into our society. It seems that uh, look around that some of the people that's coming out of community colleges have uh, more opportunity for jobs than people coming out of university today. Is there anything you'd like to comment on that? Well, I don't think it's uh, it's fair to uh, uh, maybe to speak of it in, in that in those black and white terms. Mm -hmm. I think that there are things that our community colleges do that prepare students more readily for the market. Mm -hmm. They're more focused, maybe in a number of the courses, in a number of the technologies. Uh, businesses and industry appreciate someone who has spent two or three years specializing, then they can take that candidate right. and they can mold them to, uh, to their style and their business. Mm -hmm. But that does not take away from the fact that uh, university graduates in the long term of, of a life experience right. have the greater opportunities and do very, very well. So they both do quite well, but there's no doubt that the rate of employment for our community college graduates remains very, very high. Yeah, that's great. Can you tell us what changes you see in the community college in New Brunswick? Well, I think the first uh, would be this, the, my opening comment. Our, our ability and the, uh, the speed at which we're changing uh, the philosophy, the makeup of courses, mm -hmm. uh, courses that you and I were familiar with, uh, really, I'm not going to suggest they're dead end. They're, they, they're just, they just don't fit into what's happening today. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's been the greatest change, that we've been able to adjust 
to the demands of the market and to, to our society and to the, the, the economy. I think that there are great changes in our distance education. We've taken the walls literally down and we've moved out into the communities with more, uh, with more emphasis. So I believe that that coupled with the access and the fact that we have not moved quite very well in the last 25 years in, in gaining access for our, for our young people in New Brunswick, I think that that deliberate move to add seats, to make our courses more accessible, I believe that uh, that's the combination of the greatest changes in our community colleges. What about accreditation? Very important topic. I, I toured the province in March and uh, I held 40 some public meetings and I would suggest that the two issues that came up every time, number one was the lack of access and number two was accreditation. If I interpret your question to mean what about the transfer of credits and what about those types right. of things, uh, we have made great progress. The universities, the community colleges, our high schools have been meeting regularly now for the past year. We've established a paper on accreditation, the transfer of credits, so that regardless of where you go for your training, be it the private sector or whatever, we've, uh, we've now started down the trail of total acceptance by the other institutions. Plus, we've, we've given great attention to prior learning experience. A plumber for 19 Ooh. years has been a good plumber quit school in grade nine, uh, why should he suddenly or she have to start all over? We now have in place the ability for that individual to come to our registrar and say, look, I quit school in grade nine for all the reasons that you and I know, yeah. but I've been a good plumber, but that industry is now closed up on me. Do I have to start over? Can you give me some kind of credit? We're now positioned to give him total credit for that prior experience so that in fact that individual does not have to start over and uh, that's been well received by our people. I think so that's excellent. Accreditation takes a number mm. of uh, a number of twists. Yeah. What about teleeducation? Exciting, isn't it? Uh, Seems to be. We've had a pilot project in cooperation with the university in the St. Andrews area now for a year. We've taken that concept and we now have in position approximately 25 locations uh, distance education locations, telecommunication being active participation, not passive, not mm -hmm. sitting and watching a monitor and reacting to that in, in a one-way form. Correct. Telecommunication implying that you can also speak to the person who's given you the instruction. The fact that an instructor in UMB can give a class and a lesson and a student on Gramanan Island or Misku Island can sit there and take part in that class and receive full credit for that it's kind of an exciting process. Well, we've taken it way beyond the concept. We actually have 25, and we we'll probably have many, many more, but we have 25 locations operating as we speak now. Is that Very right? exciting. That's, that is really exciting, isn't it? Great cooperation. We have a lot, uh, you know, we have a lot of things to iron out. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have this whole business of, uh, of, uh, of, of accredits and, uh, and of instructors, and there are, oh, there are a lot of things, but we're busy working at it, and all the stakeholders are cooperating, so it's not a question of when will this happen. This is now part of the education system, post-secondary education system in the province of New Brunswick. Look what that will do to access. Mm -hmm. Students may not have to even leave their community for the, to gain uh, credit for their first two years at university and or community college. Quite exciting. That seems to be a great yes. breakthrough, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. In other words, education is not an island no among longer. certain groups. No longer, no. and and I'm not blaming groups, but because you know there's been a lot of uh, historic jurisdictional right. jealousy, right. and I won't bore you with no, that. No. Uh, that's yesterday's news. That's right. uh, today, the uh, uh, the administrators of the various universities and institutions have totally opened their uh, uh, have totally opened their gates, and we're making great progress. Great progress on this. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm. What about youth apprenticeship? A program that we've done in cooperation with the federal government, uh, and I certainly want to give credit there, it's something that the two levels of government d demonstrated that uh, you can get beyond the bureaucracy and all of those other things and get on with things. Uh, we have our youth access uh, stations operating, something like 17,000 students have had access and have, and have got... Have, proceeded with their lives mm -hmm. uh, through our, our, a number of our youth strategy and our youth access centers. That brings up the entire question of youth apprenticeship, which has been introduced this year in a number of our high schools. Uh, the fact that a business have stepped in and said, we will take high school students and we will share with them over a two and three year period. So that when they graduate, and think about this for a moment, 
The greatest barrier that many of our students had to face upon graduation was this whole question of lack of experience. Right. You and I, when we graduated, we could either go to college, university, or go down and get a job at a shoe store or a bank. That's not as available today. That's We're now providing an opportunity for our high school students to be gainfully employed within an industry while they're attending high school. And at the end of their high school and upon graduation, the certificate will say this student has graduated from such and such place and has two or three years experience in the following business industry or technology. Now, isn't that and an That's extremely step? important, isn't it? It sure is. And we're piloting it this year in cooperation with the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to think that this will take off like a forest fire. And it will be uh, certainly uh, not the exception, but will be the design uh, in the years to come. It's a very exciting thing. It also has a, another angle to it, and that is we're bringing industry and business right inside mm -hmm. our classrooms. Right. And we're removing all those barriers that uh, we once had in this, this whole mysterious field of education. Yeah. You should be really congratulated for all these things. Uh, well, a number, a tremendous is, breakthrough, isn't thing it? Is, yeah, I think so. I, mean, I, I wouldn't certainly want to take credit, uh, even our department. I think these are things that we've been working towards, but uh, uh, maybe we, we have sort of been the, the uh, the igniting force here, and we've just moved on with it. It's been a commitment by the government, and uh, there's no end to this. Oh. So one can't sit here and say, we've accomplished this. All that we've done is open the door, and let's just see what the heck will happen. And it's taken off. A lot of people don't know about this, do they? No, no, you and it's a very di but it's a difficult thing to stand on a mountaintop yeah. and pontificate. Yeah. It's almost has to it has to happen to the soul right. and to society. Education is a painfully slow system as far as changes right. and and it's a subtle change and it's like being a school teacher as opposed to another business quite often you get satisfaction instantly and quite often you have to wait 25 years before you meet someone downtown who says hey i remember you yeah. uh, you helped me a lot at that time and education seems to be that way the the changes are there they're off and running, they're motivated, and I think, uh, Carmen, what we have to do, we have to be patient enough to sort of move with them and, and recognize these changes as they start to flow on our society. That's the exciting part. But yeah, right. they are, in fact, occurring, and I would invite the public to uh, maybe become a little bit more interested, drop into their, their local community college, university, or high school, and, uh, and sort of bounce off them what's new and exciting. We tend to hear only those things which are creating problems, That's right. regardless of what system. Yeah. But you and I both know that uh, the good things are outnumbering the negative things nine to one, regardless of the topic. Right. Mm. What about student loans? Uh, yeah. A difficult for some students, uh, extremely difficult for students this day and age, not only are the costs going up, not only tuition going up, but the job market has been shrinking on them, mm -hmm. and they're not guaranteed those summer jobs. And we've taken that problem, and we said, well, we only have X amount of funds. And uh, I was shocked at the number of students who were running out of support in March and April. So we said, let's rededicate this to what they were for. We've taken the student loan, and we said the student loan in bursary now is there for the students who need it most. I would love to be able to sit here and say, we have universality in post-secondary. We don't. No. The citizens aren't ready to take that on. We can't guarantee complete financial support mm -hmm. to all our students. The support to a student still in our society, without going into that debate, but in our society, the main responsibility rests with the individual and his or her, her parents. The student loan is there as a third or fourth network. Right. We've gotten away from that a bit. We've revised it. We've established a loan loan bursary, which enables access for those students who need it most, enables greater access Yes, they're going to be committed to paying back part of that, which has turned out to be a dilemma. But we're trying to tie that into their income contingency. We're saying to the students that at the end of four years, we're not interested in you being in a hole of debt of $30,000. we are going to create a ceiling on that. We're going to give a $500 reimbursement from the loan each year that they succeed at their classes. We're going to establish a ceiling. Then we're going to say to that student upon graduation, your ability to repay that will be based upon the type of job that you have. 
if you have a good sound engineering job, just for the sake of examples, then you should be able to maybe come up to this type of an arrangement of right. payback right. and gradually into other areas. If you don't find a job, then we're going to carry that issue with you. We're not going to force you to create a, a dilemma for you. We're not interested in putting our students in debt. No. We're interested in providing the funds for them, and then we're interested in providing some form of a, of a uh, comfortable payback so that the students following them can take benefit of this. One of the reasons we're facing this problem, Carmen, and people may not be aware of it, that we have a lack of repayment of student loans in Canada that's something in the area of 2 to $3 billion. Is that right? That's shocking. Mm. And we have millions within New Brunswick. And really what that means, and most of those people, it's just a lack of paying attention to pay back. Right. But they don't realize that that's caused the pressure on our students of today. Right. So we're trying to address all the above. Uh, yes, I think I'll be able to stand the Legislative Assembly, hopefully, uh, in the fall session, and maybe, maybe give a report to the citizens of New Brunswick, an update as to where we are in our student loans and our bursary. It continues to be a very stressful part for our students, but we hope we hope we're preventing our colleges and, and universities from becoming elitist. I'm not the least bit interested in us going back to the day when only those who come from very comfortable homes could afford to go on to post-secondary. Let us never fall back to that. We have to keep addressing that. Well, that's very incredible, isn't it? Mm. Uh, is there anything that I've missed, Vaughn, uh, in the relation to uh, education? Because we're going to move on to labor now. Uh, anything that you'd like to say? In, uh... Well, I'm very excited about the fact that, uh, particularly with our universities and community colleges, that there's a new awareness of, of teaching as a skill, right. that teaching does not stop at grade 12, that uh, instruction and, uh, and your experiences at universities, because I heard a great deal of that in my travels, right. uh, that, uh, that, that the whole quality of teaching and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that our universities in New Brunswick are leading the way in addressing that, and they're making a number of changes, and everyone's on side. So I, I think that, uh, that in spite of the fact that we have a lot of problem with the bottom line, and that's, uh, there's only one pot of money, right. I like to think that uh, we in New Brunswick are probably in a very preferred situation as opposed to a number of other provinces who have many more difficulties than we. So I feel rather comfortable of how we're making our way. That's great. Moving on to one of the other areas of your responsibilities, labor. How's mm. things happening in labor management relations today? I think one of the most difficult things is the whole science or art of labor management. I, I think, Carmen, in fairness, I, uh, I learned a great deal that, uh, uh, that uh, the inability of parties uh, to leave their historic baggage outside of, uh, outside of meeting rooms mm -hmm. was a lesson that I had to come to grips with. Uh, now, let me qualify that. I have found that there's been a history develop of a lack of trust and a, even a lack of concern. And all sides are both guilty and innocent of this. And I found that as I went down the road of labor management negotiations, that probably the, the greatest thing to, to work on, and if I had a skill, the thing that I was going to concentrate on was that each had to learn to respect each other again. And I think we've made some progress. These are tough times. Uh, there's only so much. And you're seeing examples throughout the province where workers have taken it on the chin. They're aware of the fact that uh, there's a limit to the hourly wage. There's a limit to the benefits. And now they're more and more willing to sit down and have a look at the whole structure. Management and ownership are also learning they can't take advantage of their workers. And they're learning they have to be quite honest in opening up their books. Right. If they're going to say to their employees, we can't afford this raise this time because of the following reasons. The, the worker is simply asking, please show us. We're, we're intelligent enough now to understand that. And I think that's where there's been some great major progress. Both sides seem to be coming, they seem to be more understanding of each other. The pressures are there, the tensions are there, but, but there is a, a growing confidence that each is being quite honest. And I would think that that has been the most obvious change in the New Brunswick scene, although we have miles to go. Yeah. I like to feel that we are moving down that road. I think that's awful important. Uh, I have a friend who played for the Canadians, Vice President uh, 
just retired. Uh, John Beliveau just stated on uh, national television the day he, after he retired for September, I believe it was CBC, that uh, self. Uh, discipline and respect were the most important issues in today's society and I think you've just alluded to both those right there when you're dealing with ma management. I think the management realized that the person who walks in their door on Monday morning other than just being a worker at whatever level that person was probably a boy scout leader or a choir director right. or did a whole bunch of wonderful things in their community and I think that whole area has allowed us to move along. I'm so glad you made the opening on uh, the Vice President of the Canadians because uh, that gives me an opportunity to congratulate you on the on the, on the paraphernalia today right. and to draw attention to the lovely uh, the lovely red jacket but also to make me feel totally comfortable. That makes us probably the two greatest Canadian fans uh, in New Brunswick today. Isn't that uh, great? Uh, my estimation of you just went uh, skyrocketed right through the ceiling. Isn't that great? Mm. And as you probably know that you have been a guest speaker at the Veterans Association, yes, which is yeah. a union, and we'll be looking for you again for our, our yeah. national. Yes, we'll have from all across Canada being held in St. John, New Brunswick in yeah. May of 1994. Yeah. So obviously you'll be yeah. there again. Well, excellent group, but just uh, you, you really, uh, it's very, very attractive and very presentable. And I want to uh, fill your bucket a bit on that. Okay, thank you. This has been a paid... Uh, <laughs> Political analysis. I love it. Okay. Yes, no. <laughs> now, how did you get these two departments together and how are they working, education and labor? It was quite simple. The boss said, uh, if you want to stay in cabinet, you can you can you handle two departments, which had always they've always been one or uh, the separate, separate advanced right. education and labor. So uh, the decision wasn't uh, it wasn't discussed in a great detail uh, in the in the analysis of where we could downsize cabinet, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of thought put into it. Right. Uh, obviously, those who make those types of decisions felt that there was a natural home, and surely enough, there is because there's so much they could learn from each other. This whole business of advanced education training training, skill development, those catchphrases that we use today, almost a total tie-in with labor, unions, the closure of a pulp mill in Athelville. What do you do with the 400 people? Mm -hmm. You have to start offering them a new, new skills right. and new options. So there's a natural home uh, for, that, uh, uh, for that amalgamation of advanced education. It's a difficult one, but uh, there's a, it's a very comfortable relationship. And they got the right man to do it. Oh, I would. <laughs> what about entrepreneur programs? Yes. Well, we offer a number of good programs, and probably the one that's gained attention in the past little while has been the entrepreneurial program because of Business Week and so on. That's a, that's a program where we offer to people who have an idea. They come in. There has to be a market. They have to make a market plan and so on. We offer them a guaranteed loan for two years up to about $10,000. Mm -hmm. There's no great risk to the citizens of New Brunswick. The success rate has been great. And uh, I think just last week, many people in Fredericton area would have noticed uh, up in the Fredericton Mall um, a few uh, booths that were demonstrating the work that these people uh, uh, provide. It's a chance to give them a boost. They're unemployed people. They have a tough time sometimes getting the, the, uh, the security and support of some of our loaning agencies, banks. And I understand that. But they have a good idea, and they've worked on it. Now we've taken a step more with our summer school students. We provide a program for them, and it's happening in about nine or ten locations in New Brunswick. For the first summer, they work in the classroom, they have speakers, they develop a plan, and they market it, and they do the analysis. In the second year, they take that plan, and they actually create an industry around it. And that's a fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. And that's somewhat of an offshoot of this entrepreneurial spirit that we're developing. So it is one of our uh, most exciting areas, the entrepreneurial uh, program. Well, and it seems to me that they probably just give you just about everything in government. You've got the Workers' Compensation Act, too. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, of course, that's, uh, that's, not a, that's a peripheral uh, uh, responsibility. We have a deputy minister and a commission. Uh, it, along with occupational health and safety, have been going through some uh, tremendous changes and some stresses. Uh, we were uh, we were headed to a point where we had, in fact, we had a chance to lose our workers' compensation because of the the the, the burden of debt that it was creating, mm -hmm. and uh, the new uh, the new uh, chairman uh, through the auspices of my department, I think, has changed and turned things around, not without pain, and the first wave of pain was felt by some of the workers. But we didn't want that to be the message. There had to be equal responsibility taken on by the employers as well as the employees. And I, I think that we're now reaching the stage where people are understanding it and, and, and they're starting to accept that there were abuses right. and we simply have tried to remove those. And we've worked on case management. 
and we're working, we're working more directly with the individual, with the aim that we're going to do everything we can to get you back into the workforce. I would think that there's been a period where that was sort of lost. And uh, we're, we're working very hard at the workers' compensation uh, mm -hmm. concept. And our, our sistering that, of course, are the uh, advances that we're making in occupational health and safety. And together, they, uh, uh, they're all part of that whole area right. of prevention. Right. And uh, I'd like to think that we've twisted that around. And financially, they got their house together. And I'd like to think that legislatively, we're moving on. Uh, we still have a lot of educating. Right. And we have a lot of work to do with a number of the different stakeholders. Did you know we're almost running out of time? I knew this would happen. In 30 seconds or left, could you tell the public what you want them to take away from today? Well, I would just like to, for them to, uh, to have the comfort that there are those of us uh, who are just working as hard as we can and, and that we're as accessible as what you and I are doing here and that uh, uh, we all whether we're the, uh, the, uh, the rate payers, taxpayers, constituents, or happen to be in the position of decisions. We're all just part of trying to create a better world for our children and our children's children. And we should never lose sight of that. And that maybe it's just a good idea to leave our eagles aside and just keep on keeping on. I, I would like to just leave it as, as informal and as friendly as that. We're their servants. Right. And when we stop believing that, then they'll let us know every four years. Right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Honorable Vaughn Blaney, to have you on. I hope you come back again, a true professional. And uh, I have a public service announcement uh, for the uh, local police and for Child Find New Brunswick. J.C. Dugard, date of birth May the 3rd, 1980, missing since June the 10th, 1991, from South Lake Tahoe, California. I've been there. It's a wonderful place. If you see anyone... Uh, fitting this description, which is going to be shown on the screen right now, would you call Child Find New Brunswick, 459-7250, or your local police department. Join us again next week. According with Carmen, your host, Carmen Kilburn, good afternoon, everyone. The New Brunswick Community Television Archive, exploring New Brunswick's history of community television programming, is an educational initiative of CHCO-TV.